everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker. Today we are reviewing Christian Dior's Dior Amour. Francois de Machis creation from 2018. I have already done the unboxing of this fragrance and first impressions. You could check those out on my YouTube channel as well. The link to the video is in the description box down below. Let's spray it on immediately. Nice sprayer. Finally, I'm getting to reviewing Dior Amour. It took me a long time. It's a very simple fragrance. A lot of people don't really care for it. Hmm. A lot of people do. A lot of people say that ever since Demachi took over the Dior Privé line and started pushing these more simple uh, creations uh, that actually... It's like almost having Cologne waters. But let's not forget that the first Privé line, which is now called Maison Dior, had three colognes, Au Noir, Bois d'Argent, and Cologne Blanche. Those were Eau de Cologne concentrations, by the way, stronger than the Eau de Parfum concentrations we have today. But enough shade said. Um, very simple. Dior wants us to layer them. Dior wants us to experiment with them. I'm more for the simplistic approach. Uh, if I, you know, get a fragrance, I want to test it, feel it, sense it on its own, in its own right, before I even fathom the idea of layering it with other fragrances. So, let's smell it out. It's... I love it, but um, basically, <laughs> the ingredients listed are just jasmine iris and powdery notes. And not just that, but Demachi has also stated that he, well, allegedly stated, because I don't have it anywhere in written form, but the sales associates at the Dior Maison counter constantly repeat to me, they say, Jacob, you know, Demachi doesn't want to list notes anymore. He just wants to list feelings and emotions and wants to portray a landscape in which uh, where to wear a fragrance rather than um, listing the notes and having you sense out the notes, smell out the notes. I'm like, okay, fine, but I still want to know what ingredients are in a perfume because at the end of the day, it is important. Some people just don't like the smell of certain things and prefer the smell of other things. You know, that also helps sales in a way. You can't just forget about the notes. But also, I think it's lazy because if you start saying, I'm not going to list the notes anymore, it's almost as if you're saying, I'm going to trick you in a way. You know, I start kind of... <laughs> My alarm clock or my alarm my alarm clock this just shows you that i had to wake up really early in the morning but i didn't um my alarm bells go off and i ask myself well why would you need to hide something because i don't buy the whole shtick of not you know listing ingredients because you want to rather you want to avoid that and rather portray a feeling i mean first of all i have that leads to stupidifying it's not even a word your um customer base because you don't want people to question anymore you just want them to live in this illusion well guess what every person has their own story fragrances tell different stories to different people you can't just push your story onto others about your creation i mean you still have to leave that freedom to people to decide on their own and to feel on their own where it's taking them and me particularly this jasmine iris powdery notes concoction which, by the way, stays very linear and intense throughout the whole lifespan on, on the skin, it takes me to a very particular place. Now, I've mentioned this briefly in my uh, unboxing. It, it's very reminiscent of Alfred Hitchcock's movies. The ones portraying his cool, cold blondes. From Grace Kelly to Tippi Hedren, we're talking that type of coolness, detachment. Um, Dior Amour would particularly have a Alfred Hitchcock movie collection here. This one, Rear Window, this one in particular, is incredible. This one is Dior Amour. Watch the movie while you wear Dior Amour and you'll know exactly what I mean. There's a sophistication and the simplicity of the powder here, which does feel as if it were, well, almost even 40s or 50s, that's the era. Those are the two decades that I would put this one in. More, more so the beginning of the 50s rather than the late 40s. So we're talking post-Second World War. We are talking 
from 1948 to 1955. That's kind of this era. Uh, that's the time frame. And let me just check what year exactly Rear Window was published in, or was... Yeah, 1954, so we're right there. Rear Window is a movie that you can watch in color. And 1954 is the year in which I would envision this perfume to be released. I know it's released in 2018, but it goes all the way back. It's it's a wonderful trigger. Now, a lot of people that review Dior Amour on all sorts of different websites classify it as very simple, uninspired, lazy. I don't know if I've read also the adjective pretentious. I wouldn't define it as any of those. Um, I don't understand why they're seems to be this need from a lot of designers or a lot of mm, customers today to demand from bigger design houses very complex creations. Dior has done its part of complexity in the 80s. Poison is extremely complex. And after Poison, I, you can't beat that. And all of the Poison flankers, including Midnight Poison that has been discontinued, unfortunately, also Hypnotic Poison, they're deep, they're intense. Dior Addict, the first release, also extremely complex. Uh, I say let them, you know, let these houses also experiment with good quality ingredients in more simpler creations. I have, I'm, I'm all for it. I have nothing against that, especially considering that they would want you or would recommend you to layer this one with other Dior Maison Dior perfumes. Now, again, I don't particularly recommend it. You can definitely do it. There's a lot of fragrances to choose from. There's a lot of money to be spent if you really want to go for it and try them all on and mix them all. There's a infinity of uh, combinations that you could mix and match to create something that matches your own skin. But that's where I kind of tend to become more suspicious and think, well, a fragrance is not... Um, I, I, you know, then I start feeling, oh, it's a marketing ploy to make you spend a lot of money. So you're giving me simpler ingredients per bottle. And then I have to mix and match them to create something more complex if I wanted to. Hence spending an enormous amount of money. Not cool. I don't find that attractive at all. Dior Amour on its own or in its own right is a Grace Kelly to me. It's the Grace Kelly of perfumes. It's that cold and cool. Smelling it now. It's borderline, it's right between being dry and sweet. It's between different facets of powder, the powdery notes and the iris, iris is powdery as well. Jasmine is more oily, but in fact, this one is powdery, but it has a bit of oil in it through the jasmine. Yes, it is synthetic. There's a lot of synthetic notes in here. I would almost say That there's an aldehyde type of quality to the opening note because it does. It it is almost champagne-y. There's a bubbly note to it in the top, which is a bit metallic. And uh, that metallic note, it's as if you have a little slightly rusted razor blade, metal razor blade, and then you could imagine going with that slightly rusty razor blade, which also has a smell of its own, and kind of cutting layers off or chipping off layers of a rosy, this color here, rosy, compact powder that is slightly scented, and you're chipping off all of that, and then you spray on it a mist of jasmine, and then you mix it all... <laughs> kind of squish it all together with iris. So you get that oily, powdery, slightly metallic feel to it. And that metallic feel is what gives Dior Amour that cold heart that is very Grace Kelly, the way a Grace Kelly that has been envisioned by Alfred Hitchcock, not the Grace Kelly that we know after. But Grace Kelly as a character in, for example, Rear Window, it's a uh, 
despite it being so powdery and um, rosy, even the color of it, it, it's like a rosy, very, very delicate, light rose liquid, it still has dirt in it. And that's that slight rusty touch. So this cold-hearted blonde beauty has a secret and it has a past. It has a it does have a complex past. And this is where Dior comes in play again. Let me show you an example. This is the first edition of the saddlebag. Now this is the John Galliano saddlebag, not the joke that's been released today. Liquefied, watered down, Dior copying themselves, Maria Grazia Curie copying Galliano not attributing even one single thank you or acknowledgement by the fact that this bag was created during the Galliano era. This is the original. What we have today, the saddlebag produced today, is the copy of the original. It's a kind of a re-edition of it, and, uh, but it'll never come close to the original genius. This is the concentration. And this is the, the heart. And this is kind of the balance of Dior Amor. Dior Amor plays with that concept of what was in the past, bringing it back into the future, into modern times, and pepping it up. I have to say, Demashi did a better job than Maria Grazia Curie ever could. Uh, her revamping certain Dior styles and um, patterns and language not good he did a good job here because what he did here was delivered a concept of the late of the mid 50s into the 2010s with modern technology because this perfume is so ethereal it's so light it's so airy at the same time in the 50s it wouldn't have been this airy it would have had a heft in the 50s it would have been more anchored to the ground it would have had more oily notes it would have had more of a of a cloying punch and Dior Amour is just borderline to becoming cloying, but it never gets there, really. And to a lot of people, that might seem to be a lack of quality. To me, it is a symbol of quality, because I do want this one to be subdued. It's not true that I wish every fragrance to be over the top, overpowering, mesmerizing from every point of view, just because it comes from a big brand and because it's very expensive. No. It doesn't always have to be. If the concept is very clear and it works for its concept, then I definitely agree with the perfume also I, would, I can definitely um, appreciate and love a fragrance that is also lighter so what Demashi did let me show you another example this is a really funny example this is another Dior bag um, here this is a really big one it's <laughs> another Galliano era what Galliano was masterfully doing he loved the 40s and the 30s um, this one obviously well it's in denim it's like a black denim and leather and it's an obvious game. Uh, it's recalling the Kelly. It's recalling the Birkin. It's giving us those vibes, but with a twist, with a playful, fun twist. It's almost like denim jeans have been, see the pockets? This pocket actually works. These don't. They're sewn together. This is the bottom of the bag. It has a double. So the bags are stuffed keep them in shape when they're archived. This is a playful continuation of what history has delivered and how we can acknowledge and respect that history, whether it be design or fragrances, and adding to it a whimsical layer. La um, Lagerfeld, I'm saying Lagerfeld, sorry about that. Galliano, but also Lagerfeld was master at it, so not that big of a mistake. Galliano was a master at doing so. This is what works. This bag functions in its historic, from the historical context, taking from the historical context, appropriating it. Yes, that's a nasty word today, isn't it? And creating something whimsical and fun, not to be taken too seriously. This is um, the concept of Dior Amour as well. And Demashi did a great job. He keeps it classy. There's nothing tacky about this fragrance, though. You know, the denim jeans version of a Dior bag that resembles some sort of way a Birkin. It, it, there's, it's a, there's a very strong trash component to it, of course. 
Idiot Amour does not have any trashy components. However, it is a revisitation of an era and of a time that, due to the way this fragrance has been described by Dior's marketing, seems as if they were not even aware of what they had in hand because they don't touch base on that. They don't touch base on the power that this fragrance really has. The description of this fragrance does not match the vision that I have of this fragrance, which brings me back to my initial thought, which is maybe you should give your viewers a bit more uh, credit and allow them to read which ingredients are in the fragrance and let them travel on their own film, movie, path, time warp, whatever have you, when they smell it. Smelling it again. When this one dries down, it it gets a, a sort of a peachy, peary, peachy, fruity note touch to it, which I love. And usually this is something that the orris root does. The orris root has the particular characteristic of the more time passes, the more it opens up and the more intense it smells. Here, orris root is not listed, only iris is listed, but could be that the iris is working the way an orris root would work as well. The orris root is the root of the iris anyway, so... Because, why am I saying this? Because with time, it's as if this iris from the dry, powdery tone has blossomed into something more rich and more opulent. So as it dries down on the skin, it stays quite close to the skin. But when you really put your nose in it, it, it has a luscious, almost lotiony, creamy, blossomy note to it. It's very delicate and if you if you don't time it right, if you don't sniff it just right, you might just miss it. And this is also why I mention Hitchcock in, in the case of, of the review of this particular fragrance because the way he edited and shot his movies, you know, back then directors usually didn't have the right, well, still today in Hollywood, you, depending what sort of contract you have, but usually the executive producers and producers have the final say on editing a movie. So you're the director, you you create it, you film it, and then they edit it and butcher it. Or, you know, Orson Welles is, a, is the saddest example of how his masterpieces were butchered uh, because they were edited behind his back. Hitchcock was clever. He knew film to a T, and he wouldn't even allow more than one or two shots of a certain scene. He knew exactly what he wanted. He would time it exactly right. What does this mean? This means that once the movie made it to the editing room, the editors had no choice but to edit it the way Hitchcock wanted it to because he only gave them the shots and the amount of material that he deemed necessary. And, and those were the shots, the shots he wanted or the shots that ended up in the final edit because he didn't shoot more. But that takes a lot of knowledge to know exactly your craft and the technical aspects of cinema making and to be able to have that wisdom to know exactly from which angle to shoot it, and you know exactly that it's going to work from that angle, with that lighting, with that length, with that speed, with that intensity, with that acting. To know that and to be able to shoot precisely what you want, that, I mean, that not, it doesn't only take craft and a lot of years of work, but also genius. Dior Amour is like that. It doesn't allow any extra edits or cuts. It's very simple. And now you see people criticizing certain compositions uh, that are simple, they're wrong in doing so. Sometimes they're right, but mostly they're wrong. And this is because sometimes simplicity is actually a virtue. To know how to use less to obtain more is really, really an art in its own right. And Demachy, in this respect with Dior Amour, really delivered that. It's, it's really that good. Dior Amour is that good. And there's a very, very big knowledge of perfume making that went into create that went into creating something as simple as this one in first appearance and in surface appears to be. So just like Hitchcock would film very short bits of film that he knew he wanted and then would not let anything else go into the editing room, same here. Very tight shots. The machine knows exactly what he's shooting, what he wants, and there's no way of putting this together in other combinations. This is the way it's put together, super simple straightforward, but with character. Smelling it again. I have the impression that our blonde, cold-hearted character had just an encounter with a lover 
And this character is now in a convertible car, mid-50s, with gorgeous leather shoes on. The leather is so supple. And we have a close-up of the foot pushing on the gas as the car drives away. The car has an incredible green lacquered finish coat all over it. And we just see the blonde hair waving in the wind as the car rushes away, leaving the scene of the crime. And that's the Or Amour. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you like this review. If you have, please do thumb it up and let me know what you think about the Or Amour in the comment section down below. Also, if you haven't but wish to, consider subscribing to my channel here on YouTube. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and also on Patreon, Super Deco Ball spelled together. Thank you to all my patrons for pledging. This helps the channel survive. I wish you all a great day or night. And until we see each other next time, never forget to never give up on love. Love you all. See you soon. Take care. Bye.